Okay, it's three minutes past nine. Let's make a start. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining on this uh, Thursday morning um, for a webinar on biodiversity net gain. I actually did one of these before exactly a year ago. It was on 9th, the 9th of March 2022 when the government was consulting on this subject. Um, but now we have some more information because they have uh, responded to the consultation and that's going to be the main focus of this uh, talk. Just a bit of housekeeping. Um, if you have any technical issues, it's well, we may be able to solve them, but it's unlikely because there's a lot of people and um, it might be something at your end or in between us. But if you use the chat function for that, my colleague Megan will have a look at that and we'll try and resolve anything if she can. If you'd like to ask questions, then please use the Q&A function, which is at the top of my screen. It may be somewhere else on your screen. Um, I am not planning to answer any questions until I've finished the presentation, and then I'll go through as many as I can until we get to 10 o'clock. Um, and we will follow up for uh, your attendance with a note of this webinar, and I will answer briefly in writing all the ones that I answered orally and the ones that I didn't answer. So hopefully you'll get an answer one way or another. And this webinar is being recorded as well. Uh, I think it will go on our YouTube channel. It will certainly become available in some way. So that's enough housekeeping. Let me give you an agenda. So since my last webinar was a year ago, and you may not have attended that, I will briefly recap what biodiversity net gain actually is. Go into a bit of detail on this uh, consultation feedback announcement on the 21st of February. Set out what I have interpreted as the next steps. And finally, think about some challenges and opportunities for people depending on what role you fulfill. So, very briefly, what biodiversity net gain is. It is essentially a new obligation on all planning permissions and development consent orders, DCOs, to improve the environment by at least 10%. It is going to be um, a compulsory planning condition from this November for all town and country planning applications, except for a few exceptions that I will cover and DCOs, it'll be another couple of years it will come in for those. Presumably it'll be an obligatory requirement in a DCO. The legal derivation of this is in the Environment Act 2021, those two sections. We will circulate the slides and when you click on something that's underlined, you will get to the source material. So you can see that. Um, it's actually two uh, schedules introduced by those sections as well. The government wants a market to be created for buying and selling biodiversity land because a lot of people are going to be looking for land. If they have a development, they're using up all their land that they own. So they'll need some other land somewhere else to provide this biodiversity net gain. So there's going to be a whole market and it's an opportunity for entrepreneurs and landowners as well as potentially a challenge, but also an opportunity for developers. How does it work? Well, the main tool is called the biodiversity metric. So what you do is you take the land you're going to use up by building on it with your development. You score it on its current biodiversity value. And I'll go into the details of the scoring in a moment on the next slide. You must then find some land somewhere else that will be improved to at least, so that the score of the, the improvement is has a score of at least 10% more of the land you have used up, the score of that. I'll go through with an example as well, <laughs> because it's a bit mathematical. Um, so you've got a sort of before score of the land you're about to um, build over 
and then you've got to have an, an after score of at least 10% better than that. You can have already improved the land, but there is a cutoff date of the 30, 30th of January 2020. Seems a bit random, but that was the date that the Environment Bill, having lapsed, was reintroduced into Parliament for the version that actually got enacted. Um, and recent news is that just like compulsory purchase, you can't suddenly try and make your land more valuable deliberately. You can't deliberately degrade land and only to improve it and then say, aha, look, I've improved it. It's got to be the, the condition it was in on that date, 30th of January 2020, that matters. So here is how the scoring system works. I tried to condense it all to one slide. So there's a lot going on here. So the first, the top half of the page is the before score. So this is the land you're about to build over. What you do is you multiply four things together to get the score. The first one is the area of the land in hectares. The second one is its distinctiveness. And there are different classifications of habitat in um, Natural England's um, biodiversity metric documentation that you'll have to look up. Distinctiveness can actually be zero if it's um, hard standing. Uh, so if you multiply four things, including a zero, you'll get a score of zero. So you don't actually need to um, gain, uh, provide any gain because 10% more than zero is also zero. But most uh, land will be will have a score of some kind. An example is grassland has a score of two. Um, the, the values are two, four, six, and eight, and zero. Um, and you have to look up the type of habitat. You may need to divide your land up if it's in more than one habitat and score each one separately and add it together. The next item you multiply is its condition. If it's in poor condition, it gets one, i.e. that doesn't change the multiplied number. And if it's in good condition, you get multiplied by three. And in the middle is moderate. So our example, we've got moderate condition. So it gets a score of two. The final one, which doesn't actually make much difference because the range is only one to 1.15, is its strategic significance. And there are only three possible values there. It's either not in a plan or it's particularly described as valuable in a plan or it's sort of in between so it's sort of uh, noted as significant but not particularly definitely um, mentioned <laughs> so let's assume in our example that it's not in the plan as as a significant habitat so in our example, we've got one hectare, it's grassland, it's in moderate condition, it's not significant. Multiply those four numbers together and you get a score of four. So that's the before score. For the after score, you uh, take the new land and you, you multiply it by those same four things. But then there are four, three more things you multiply it by, which all reduce the number. They're all, well, they might not, they might keep it the same, but they won't make it any bigger anyway. Uh, and those three things are the difficulty of creating this habitat, assuming you haven't already created it. If it's a low difficulty, i.e. it's easy to create, then it's one you multiply it by, doesn't make any difference to the score, down to if it's a very high difficulty, that's 0.1, so you're going to need 10 times as much land if it's very difficult to create. Um, in our example, let's say, it's a medium difficulty to create this habitat. Obviously, if you have already created it, it's going to be low difficulty because it's there already. Then the next one is a temporal score about how long it's going to take to create this habitat, which is interesting. Um, if it's already created, then it'll be one. And you can take up to 30 years, or in fact, you can take longer than 30 years, but the score doesn't change if it's going to take longer than 30 years from th the score for 30 years. Um, which is somewhat surprising that you can take that long to create this habitat, but there you go. If it's um, it's a sort of sliding scale between one going down to 0 0.32, if it's going to take 30 years, let's say it's going to take two years. So you look it up in the biodiversity metric document and it tells you that's a discount of 0 0.967. Um, and the final one is 
how near this land is to the land you're developing. A spatial discount. If and it, it actually doesn't make any difference if it's anywhere in the same local, local authority area, so it doesn't have to be right next to the property. It could, if you're in a big area, it could be quite a long way away and still not be discounted. So it's a one if it's in the same local authority area. If it's one local authority away, then it's 0 0.75. And if it's anywhere else, two or more local authorities away, then it is 0 0.5. So that's also quite interesting that once you're two local authorities away, it could be anywhere in England. So if you're in Cornwall, then if, you're, if your development is in Cornwall and your new land is in Cornwall, then that's one. If it's in Devon, well, I think this is district level authorities. If it's in West Devon, then it'll be 0 0.75. But if it's anywhere else, London, Cumbria, uh, Dorset, it'll all be 0.5. So you multiply the four things for the score before and these three things for the score for the after to get your new your new score and that new score has to be at least 10% bigger than the old score. So in our case we need to uh, get a score of 4.4 4, which is 10% more than the four and if you in those examples if you multiply it all together it works out that you need to find um, 4.5 hectares. So that's interesting. You started with one hectare that you're building on. You've now got to find, if it's in the neighboring authority, then you've got to find 4.5 hectares. That's quite a lot more. Um, there is no like for like require obligation um, for this metric the only the only one that isn't a purely numbers based rule is essentially that you can't trade down the distinctiveness so if your distinctiveness is 4 then the new land must have a distinctiveness of at least 4 but it could be a different type of habitat that scores that so you can't have just go for twice as much area that's got a distinctiveness of 2 it's got to get be at least as good otherwise it's it's a pure numbers calculation. So that's how the metric works. Um, there are links, if not already in a later slide, the last slide, to where the metric can be found on Natural England's website. Um, it does get uh, updated every so often. We're on version 3.1 at the moment. And I suspect that the one that actually gets launched with when the um, BNG comes into legal force will be another one so watch out for it changing but I think it's fairly stable as well at the same time so it's not going to change that much. So what happened last year at the in the middle uh, when I did this uh, webinar previously the um, it was in the middle of this consultation on how it was all going to work there's a link to the consultation document which actually gave quite a good idea of how the government sees, saw it as working, but did ask a lot of questions. On the 21st of February this year, um, the report, a report on the consultation outcome was published that gives a lot more detail about what they're actually going to do now. So that was, I jumped at the chance to update everyone on another webinar, which was quite short notice, but it I thought it was worth striking while the iron was hot. Um, the headlines essentially are that it is still coming in November this year for Town and Country Planning Permission, and it's still coming in for November 2025 for development consent orders. Um, interestingly, it, it says everyone who wasn't a developer of a development consent order wanted it to come in sooner for them but all the developers wanted it to come in later so we decided to make it the same as we originally proposed um a slight wrinkle for dcos it it although it doesn't say it in the consultation document in surrounding documents it suggests that it's only terrestrial parts of dcos that are going to come in then marine by marine gain is a whole new topic a different topic um, obviously, if you're you're doing something in the sea, how can you develop a habitat that's some other sea somewhere else? It doesn't quite make sense in the same way. So they're going to have to do it in a different way. 
So it'll only be for the marine elements of DCOs that will come in in November 2025. So if you're an offshore wind farm, the wind farm probably won't uh, attract BNG, but the onshore cable and anything at the coast will do so. The, I was asked a lot last time as I left it off the slides, what, when is the, what, what stage does your project have to have got before it has to uh, comply with BNG? Not entirely clear, even in this document, but I would guess if it's if you make an application after the date, so sometime in November. Uh, but it may be a different thing. You may, it may be if it's a big project and you've got a, <clears throat> a scoping opinion or something, maybe that means you don't have to do BNG if you're that far along. So we'll have to see what the actual regulations say. So there's a caveat there. But it's probably if you make the application. Other points in the 21st of February um, document that I highlight here. These bit in no particular order. There will be exemptions that don't require the BNG. Householder applications. So your loft extension, you don't have to um, have some habitat site somewhere else. Areas, very, very small ones of less than 25 square meters. It's barely bigger than a living room. Um, a BNG site itself does not then have to do more BNG in a sort of Zeno's paradox. Um, and permitted development does not have to uh, provide BNG. That's what PD stands for. So permitted development, if you don't know what that is, various bodies and types of development don't need an actual planning application. They're just assumed to get planning permission. It still is a permission. But um, as long as you're within all the scope of that, then you won't need to do um, biodiversity net gain. However, it notes that some things it's it consulted on whether they should become exempt or not going to be exempt. So brownfield, i.e. previously developed land, still will attract BNG. Even changes of use will attract BNG. Although in most cases, I wouldn't have thought you were actually affecting any new land or changing the habitat value of the land. It's probably zero to start with, but it may not be, so be careful. Temporary applications still will attract BNG, so even if you're doing something only for a period of time and then going back and stopping doing it. And it mentions some types of project you would have, would have been covered by permitted development had they not been in conservation areas or national parks, but those ones are still applications and they will still require BNG. Next point is irreplaceable habitat. For example, ancient woodland will be treated separately. So it'll have its own whole system of how it's treated and how you have to deal with it. And so it's outside the BNG metric and the calculation. This is, I mean, ancient woodland because of it, because it's ancient, if you just plant some new trees, they won't be ancients. And so you're not really replacing it properly. Um, so watch out for separate um, measures on irre irreplaceable habitat. Um, headline point is try and avoid taking up any irreplaceable habitat. Um, there was a, a suggestion in the docu con consultation document that for, if you were a, um, develop, a frequent developer with a large estate of land, and it mentioned organizations like uh, National Highways, Network Rail, National Grid specifically, then you might be able to do have a whole, your own internal system of providing BNG within your uh, estate, but it seems to have a dro to drop that proposal. So you're just going to be treated like everyone else. You'll have to put land on the register if you're offering it and you'll have to use, just go do the same things that everyone else has to do. Um, as I mentioned before, it specifically says if habitat degrades either naturally or deliberately since January 2020, then you won't be able to um, say improve it back up again and count that. It's what state it was in in January 2020 that matters. The um, I didn't actually say this in describing BNG, but you have to undertake to keep it in the habitat 
that you are promising for at least 30 years. Government appears to have an aspiration to make that longer over time, um, but it commits to not reviewing that length until at least 2026. And I also, it appears that um, any BNG that has been provided up until then won't have to, won't be extended, so that they'll all keep their 30-year commitment. They won't have to be longer, but any new one, new BNG after then might have to have a longer period. Um, it, it, you can you will be able to sell excess BNG, put it on the register. So if say you um, have a development, you find some land for your BNG, but in fact it provides 120% of the score, i.e. is a 20% increase, then you could just use the 10% that you're obliged to use for your own development increase and put the other 10% on the BNG register and it could be used for another project. They are conscious that this might mean that every project only ever does 10% because it always puts the extra, the surplus on the register for something else. And they'd rather that projects um, generally um, could go higher than 10%. So they're going to monitor that and they might eventually not let you uh, put your excess BNG onto the register. Um, so watch this space on that one. But for the moment, if you're a developer, you can perhaps offset the cost of your development by selling the excess BNG. There's a concept of additionality. So this is um, where your land is already earmarked for some other environmental purpose. Can you also count it as BNG? And the general principle is yes, in most cases you can count it for BNG as well. However, at least 10% of it must be pure BNG and nothing else. And that's 10% of the 110% that you're providing, if that makes sense. Um, however, it does list in uh, one of the other documents some types of land that you can't use for uh, BNG as well as using for this other purpose. And the three examples it gives are restocking trees. I'm not quite sure under what heading that might happen. EIA, Environmental Impact Assessment Compensation Land, can't also be counted for PNG and marine licensing. Uh, so that might be something you need a marine license from the MMO, so below the high water mark uh, might not count for BNG as well. But you need to look at the detail for all those. Um, so additionality, you can double count land for other purposes. Uh, like nutrient neutrality, for example, uh, but at least 10% of it must be pure BNG. Um, I haven't actually said in my description of BNG uh, how it is secured and how what your obligation is. So when you put in your planning application, you have a plan in as one of the application documents that um, says how you're proposing to provide BNG, and then a condition of the planning permission will be to um, provide it and uh, monitor it and so on and make sure and commit to it being provided for the 30 years. So um, that's how that's going to work. Uh, one of the big things is because it's going to be the um, way this market in BNG is created is called the Biodiversity Site Register. So it's expecting landowners and entrepreneurs to um, develop land that they will then offer for BNG to anyone who is developing their, uh, as a development. And it'll go on this central register so you can look it up. Um, it'll presumably say what level of distinctiveness it is given that you can't go for a lower distinctiveness. Um, so hopefully there's a range of distinctivenesses on there uh, and the higher the better if you're the you're developing some land to put on the register because then more developments will be able to use your land. This um, is going to be maintained and created by Natural England. Um, so presumably it will be on a website somewhere. Um, the, the twin purposes appear to be that 
if you're if you need some BNG land and you don't have any yourself, you can look on this register for it, and it'll also um, be sort of um, on a, become unavailable once a development is uh, allocated to it, and so it'll make sure that any la BNG land is only used for one development and you don't keep reselling the same land for several developments. Um, the uh, consultation document says there will be a fee to go on the register and it will be somewhere between 100 and a thousand pounds. Um, of great interest to me as a lawyer, it says any land going on the register must be accompanied by a legal agreement that gives sufficient confidence that it will satisfy the requirements of biodiversity net gain. So such things as that it will definitely be available for 30 years. There will be no conflicting uses of the land. It gives examples like shooting on the land. Not very good for habitats. Um, and so on. Uh, <coughs> and there are two main ways to secure the land, i.e. Um, promise and or legally commit yourself to providing it for 30 years. One is um, a section 106 agreement, which you'll be familiar with if you're in uh, planning uh, under the Town and Country Planning Act. And the other one is a new thing under the Environment Act called a Conservation Covenant, which is a bit like a BNG style section one, a bit like a section 106 agreement, but specifically for BNG. Um, and similarly, it will run with the land and any changes in ownership, it will still apply to new owners. Timings. So I put these in order of size rather than the order of um, time. So the very small developments, the exempt ones that were on the previous slide will never have to provide BNG. Similarly, any that uh, it comprise hard standing will never have to provide BNG. The uh, news is that small sites, which it defines in the consultation response and I summarize as between one and nine dwellings taking up, uh, or if it's the number of dwellings is not apparent, then less than if it's residential, then half a hectare. If it's non-residential, then it's 100 square meters of floor space or less than one hectare if the floor space is not able to be determined. That's a small site. They are being delayed for them. BNG, so they won't have to do it, provide it for 20, November 2023, but they will have to for spring 2024. So it's not a huge delay, it's about four months. All other planning uh, applications um, under the Town and Country Planning Act will have to provide BNG by November this year. And when it comes to nationally significant infrastructure projects consented under the Planning Act 2008, they'll have, but it is, does appear to be just the terrestrial elements of them. They won't, they all won't have to provide it until November 2025. There are quite a lot of next steps scattered through the document. I've tried to collect them according to type um, in on this slide and the next slide. So there appear to be promised consultations on, presumably these will all have to take place before November this year. Um, the definition of what irreplaceable habitat is, there'll be a consultation on that. Um, there'll be a consultation on whether variations of existing planning permissions will also attract biodiversity net gain and to what extent. Um, so perhaps you have a planning permission, but you apply under the planning at, uh, Town Country Planning Act to vary it in some way. Does that variation attract BNG? Well, I'd have thought it probably ought to. Um, or perhaps you have to rescore the varied planning permission, and if it's a higher score, then you'll have to provide a bit more BNG. Um, eventually, national policy statements under the Planning Act 2008 will incorporate um, obligations for BNG, but in the meantime, there's going to be an overarching set of paragraphs that will effectively uh, be incorporated in uh, as if they were incorporated in every national policy statement and this will be called the biodiversity gain statement that there is a commitment to consult on that the drafting of that this year so there's a lot going on on national policy statements this is an add-on to that as well and finally 
Um, this is the national planning policy framework. If there are any knock-on effects of BNG required, then there'll be a consultation on those. So that's all the consultations I found in that document. There's some guidance promised surrounding. That's a relief because we need guidance on all this. Um, there'll be guidance on what a legal agreement that I referred to to get onto the biodiversity gain register will have to have in it. One of the things it does say it will have to have is a habitats management and monitoring plan. And there'll be a template for such a plan um, provided as well. Um, there'll be guidance on what is appropriate off-site biodiversity net gain. I hope it won't be much more than, well, you can't have a lower distinctiveness and you will be discounted the further away you are, up to two local authorities away. Um, but we'll see, so watch out for that. There will be further guidance on BNG specific conservation covenants and section 106 agreements. There'll be also be guidance on this term they call stacking of payments. So this is a bit like additionality. If you're getting income for one purpose, can you also get income for BNG? And I think you can, but there'll be guidance on which ones you're allowed to get twice as get this get two types of income for the same land and they call that stacking and finally there'll be guidance on the use of biodiversity credits another thing i didn't mention in my summary at the beginning so if you can't find any land or you're in a hurry or something can't find any land yourself or you can't find any on the register because there aren't enough entries on there or there aren't enough of the right type or something there will be an, a, a fail-safe backstop method of just throwing money at the problem and buying what are called biodiversity credits from the government. Um, and it says, again, confirmed in the uh, 21st of February document, that these will be deliberately expensive because they don't want to interfere with this creation of a market in biodiversity um, land. So it's, it will be a last resort because you're going to be have, having to fork out uh, a lot of money for these credits. And the value of those credits will be announced this year, the initial value, and it will be reviewed every six months. I think I might say that on the, uh, yes, this slide. So here's some other next steps that aren't guidance or consultation. Um, so whereas Section 106 agreements are entered into with uh, local authorities, conservation covenants can be entered into with other bodies, although they probably will mostly be local authorities as well. Um, and you will have to apply if you're one of these bodies who wants to become a responsible body, as it's known under for conservation co covenants, you can apply to become one, supposedly from early this year. It's already not very early this year, so that is presumably imminent. Um, the actual legal re regulations for biodiversity net gain will have to come out. Um, I am told that this should be in the next couple of months. Hopefully it will be well in time for November this year. Um, and that will hopefully give any transitional provisions about what stage your project has to have got to before you or have not got to before you have to um, provide BNG etc and all the legal mechanics of it. There will be a template, there was one a draft template in the in the original consultation document, there will be a final template for the biodiversity gain plan that you must that must accompany your planning application that will be published at some point, uh, hopefully well in advance of November. This uh, credit price where you can throw money at the problem will apparently be um, announced, the initial one, by the end of May, and that will be reviewed every six months. I imagine there'll be a different price for one unit of each type of distinctiveness, but uh, watch this space. As I mentioned, the fee for going on the register will be also announced in advance of applications becoming open. And applications will only be open by November. So it might be a bit earlier, but it looks as though there might not be even any land on the register at the time that BNG becomes uh, legally required. 
So that might be an issue. I would hope that the opening of the register would be a bit earlier, so at least there's some land there. Um, but perhaps you can um, do some bilateral agreements with landowners um, separately from finding land on the register uh, in advance of your application by November. So a couple more um, slides before I open the q and I haven't even looked at it yet, but there are 27 <laughs> questions already. Um, so just an appreciation of the scale of the impact. Here we are in March, so it is only eight months till it comes into force. And I really haven't seen that much about how tran transformational to the planning system this is going to be. There are something like 400,000 or 350,000 planning applications every year. Um, although the vast or the majority of those are the ones that are likely to be exempt like householder applications. However, I still calculate a rough estimate. There will be about 100,000 that will require uh, be required to provide BNG. So that's a lot. <laughs> that's going to start in November this year. Um, if you imagine all the land that those um, applications will take up, given that in the example you needed to provide four and a half times as much land, that is an awful lot of extra land that's got to be found somewhere to provide uh, BNG, and that is every year for that much. So we're talking a really big, uh, <laughs> big thing here. Um, currently, most applications simply lose biodiversity. They don't even, um, even though there's a sort of recommendation in leg legislation to try and um, offset biodiversity and in the National Pl Planning Policy Framework, um, because it's not compulsory, I doubt th that many applications currently do it. But suddenly, from November, they're actually legally obliged to provide this offsetting land, uh, improved land. So just think of the area of land every year that's going to be needed. Um, I think there will, well, clearly, there will be a contrast between um, urban developments and rural developments, whereas urban areas, the score, the, the before score will be quite low. The availability of nearby land will also be low, so you'll probably need to use the register more, uh, finding land further away. Whereas rural areas, you might already have land in your possession that you can um, upgrade to provide the BNG or at least find some land next door. So there's going to be quite a contrast between urban and rural developments as well, I think. Um, but as far as I can tell, this is big. This is big. Uh, here are some considerations for developers of land. So a little footnote that it may not be exactly the, ap the applications from November this year. We need to check the transitional provisions in the BNG regulations, but that would look like the appropriate moment. If you make an application after a certain date in November, then you will have to provide 10% of biodiversity net gain. Some local authorities already have higher figures in their policy. So for example, I think uh, Cambridge have 20%, but um, those are not legal obligations. You obviously do better if you do provide that, but there's a certain trading off uh, that if you do something else good or you, you satisfy some other policies in the balance, you might get away with not providing the full amount the local authority has in its policy, but you will still have to provide at least the 10%. Um, so I think if you are a developer so, uh, looking for sites for, to develop, you will have to l calculate the value of those sites in the before value and consider that as part of your site selection. So if you've got a high before value, then um, that might mean you don't select that site or it, 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 it scores less in your site selection calculations. Um, and how you offset the BNG, provide the BNG might um, also be a consideration site selection. So it's going to be quite an early, early consideration. Um, the cost of the development, if because these um, are going to be quite expensive, these uh, biodiversity units, 
uh, whether on the register or you even worse purchasing the credits. We're talking about several thousand pounds a unit. Um, so the cost of the development will go up. Um, but if you are providing more than 10% biodiversity net gain, then uh, perhaps you can offset your costs by uh, putting the surplus on the register or and or directly selling it to another developer who is looking for some. There are many more developer considerations, no doubt. Landowner considerations. <clears throat> so good luck landowners. It's good. It's probably generally good for you that BNG is coming in because you own some land. Lots of people are going to be looking for land to um, uh, allocate for their biodiversity net gain. Uh, you may well have land that is not developed. Perhaps you don't want to develop it. Um, but if you increase its biodiversity value, then you can put it to some use and make some money out of it. So well done you. Um, if you're selling some land and it has biodiversity net gain value, that may improve the value of the land when selling it. And although as a developer throwing money at a project for biodiversity credits, I think the government isn't just going to keep the money. It will actually uh, use it to um, find some land somewhere to develop for biodiversity net gain. So even the government as um, as a biodiversity credit provider will have to find the land itself from somewhere. I'm not sure how that's all going to work. Um, there's not much of that, that in the um, consultation document. Um, and as the, uh, particularly since the 21st of February, but I thought this all along, there are going to be a huge number of developments. They're definitely going to have to provide BNG this November. So it seems a pretty low risk to start um, improving land for biodiversity net gain purposes now um, and getting ready to put it on the register and all that sort of thing. Uh, so there you go. So even if you are, a, you may be a big, big developer with a big uh, estate like National Highways or Network Rail, so you could start developing the land as well as thinking about it for your own developments. But it's not just developers and landowners, there are opportunities. I look at the challenges as opportunities wherever I can. Um, there is a sort of economic assessment that came out with the consultation last year, and it gave a massive range for a value of one unit. I pr presumably it depends on the distinctiveness of the habitat, but it, it ranges from £4,000 to £100,000. So perhaps that's a distinctiveness of eight, the top one. I think there's a type of habitat called blanket bog that has a value of eight. So let's all look up what blanket bog is and see if we can create some of that. Um, the metric is subjective, so it talks about condition, difficulty uh, of creation and how long it will take to create. So environmental consultants will be able to advise on that. And in fact, the guidance uh, sorry, is it the guidance or the consultation response document says, um, no, it's, it's there's guidance that came out on the 21st of February, guidance for landowners as well. And it says qualified ecologists would be calculating the biodiversity units for you. So that's nice if you're a qualified ecologist to be uh, name checked there. So you're going to be asked to um, calculate the units. Presumably it will give it more credibility. Um, if someone who's qualified provides the unit, the, the, the calculation. Uh, entrepreneurs who are looking for something to do uh, and somewhere to make money can create buy and sell biodiversity units. And indeed, there are several companies, You a simple Google search will find several uh, that are doing this already. Um, they will obviously, if they want to go on the register, they can't do that yet and don't even know exactly what they have to do to get on the register. So no doubt they will need um, advice and need to track what's going on, how to get onto the register, this legal agreement, which I'll come to in a minute. Um, but there's a big opportunity there. Um, and charities may wish to develop land for biodiversity net gain for charitable purposes. Um, 
so that's a, another consideration. There's something in it for everyone here, I think. Finally, I'm a lawyer and um, I, <laughs> I would like some work. So why not focus on what the last thing is this biodiversity gain register legal agreement that gets prominence in the consultation response document. So every entry on the register is going to have one of these legal agreements. I'm not quite sure whether the legal agreement is a thing on top of a section 106 agreement or a conservation covenant or is just the section 106 or conservation covenant. Either way, you'll need one or other or both of these. So I commit that we are going to track what is required in the guidance and um, for a legal agreement to go on the register. Um, and we will develop a template agreement and um, tailor it for your land if you uh, if you want. Obviously, that won't be free, though, that last bit. Um, and we will make sure it satisfies the guidance once that guidance comes out. Um, I've already been tracking developments in biodiversity net gain for a year, and I'm not going to stop now. So um, keep in touch if you're interested, and um, uh, I will... Uh, keep uh, notifying people when the, the all those guidance and consultations and other developments happen as we go along. Our uh, firm's website already has a biodiversity net gain specific page. I will include a link to that. I think there's one on the next slide, but I'll put it again in uh, further uh, communications following this webinar. So that's the end of my monologue. Uh, we have 11 minutes left. That took a bit longer than I was expecting. So I will start tackling the questions. There are now 47 questions. Um, so I'm not going to get nearly through any all of them. Let's have a go. Uh, first question. Your first slide stated improve the environment by 10%. Is this distinct from improving biodiversity? Um, no, I did mean improving biodiversity there. Although I have to say there is another concept called environmental net gain, which is a wider concept, but at the moment that's not um, a legal obligation, but it's something worth keeping tabs on that may eventually be also be required as a wider thing. I'm just talking about biodiversity net gain here. Um, if I, oh yes, I can cut and paste all these questions into a document just in case they all disappear for some reason. Um, but I will, because when I, when you click answer live, it goes away from my list, uh, but I'm not sure. So next question, I'm just reading these out completely <laughs> with no preparation, so it could say anything. We have a site that has been allocated for housing since 2004 and has been retained as an allocation but it is all woodland, brackets, very unusual, I know. And the allocation is silent on BNG or other ecology. The council are now struggling because the ecologists object and mitigation would be so vast as to render the allocation redundant. So on the one hand, the allocation exists and they can't just discount it. On the other hand, there is no means to reasonably mitigate the loss of woodland. What takes priority and can they insist on BNG, accepting that this effectively throws out an agreed allocation? Um, well, I'm afraid, it doesn't matter whether it's allocated for development in the local plan or anything like that. It will still have to provide 10% BN, BNG come November. So unless you get your application in before then, you will have to provide it and whether or not it is allocated in the plan. That's my take on that one. Next. Hi Angus, is there information on the transition arrangement if an outline planning application is submitted and or consented prior to November when the legislation comes into force, how is BNG dealt, dealt with? Uh, there will be information on the transition arrangements, but there isn't yet. Um, and that is a good example of where it might not be that clear. Uh, does the outline, if you calculate in the outline planning application, get that in, does that mean you're okay when you then put in your reserve matters application or not? I'm afraid you'll have to wait until the transitional provisions are published. So we don't know, but that's something to look out for. He said unhelpfully. Is there a definition of, of quotes, plan when considering st strategic significance? Yes, there is. 
you need to look at the biodiversity metric, the particular wording. There wasn't enough room to put it um, on uh, the slide, but it is there is more detail in the metric. Obviously, you'll need to use the metric. In fact, you'll need to ask your qualified ecologist to look at the metric. Um, and the actual full details of how all those scores are arrived at are set out in there. And there's a link on this very slide. Land being used up by the development, does that include the footprint of both above ground and underground infrastructure, e.g. would land reinstated after underground cables are installed be excluded? That is uh, an interesting question. Well, it certainly includes the above ground footprint. Um, if you are harming land temporarily, um, I think we'll have to look, you'll have to look at the detail of the development. The fact that the consultation response said temporary uses of land, applications for temporary uses of land will be caught by BNG suggests that um, te land temporarily is disturbed by what will eventually be a permanent development, such as underground infrastructure might also be caught. So, but maybe the score will be discounted for the temporary nature of it in some way. So that might be mentioned in the metric already or might eventually be mentioned in the regulations and guidance. So watch out for that. But I will I might have a look at the uh, metric after this ends uh, to check that if it's if there's anything available now. If a planning application is being determined by a county council, does this mean the BNG land can be anywhere within that county for the full area score? Or is the LPA meant to be the district? Uh, I think it is uh, the district, but I would have to confirm that in writing. Um, actually, it's quite interesting that a lot of uh, local authorities are moving from one type to the other, generally towards unitary authorities. And um, there are a few coming in this April, for example. Um, so watch out for that rather uh, changing um, area. So if something, if you were in a small district and it becomes a big unitary, good news, you can now look at a lot more land for your uh, uh, BNG without it being discounted for spatial, a spatial discount. But I'll confirm, I think it's the district, but I will confirm that. Um, if outline permission is granted pre-November, oh, that's the same question as before, we don't know fully, it, um, we'll have to wait for the regulations and guidance, I'm afraid. Already seeing exemptions for significant developments, recent case in Lake District where a proposal has been exempted. It is in a former quarry, but the ecology report has highlighted impact on bats on the site and the site is immediately adjacent to ancient woodland and other de designations. Are you really seeing exemptions for specific significant developments? Um, oh, I've just thought of a, a work opportunity for myself there. If you, um, if you're not ready in time for your significant development and it could become an NSIP, you could apply under Section 35 of the Planning Act to make it one, and then you'll get two more years uh, before you have to provide BNG. Um, anyway, there is, there is, as far as I know, no power to exempt particular developments, um, although maybe there will be in the, in the regulations, but I don't think there's going to be. So I'm not sure what that's talking about the case in the Lake District. Um, I'd be interested to hear more about that. So if you ask that question, do email me with more details. Uh, many thanks for this presentation. Is the policy clear about whether BNG would be a requirement for Highways Act orders, projects, or other major projects consenting regimes? Um, it just said my um, connection is unstable. So I apologize if I'm frozen or you can't hear me properly. Let's hope it recovers. Um, it is, oh, well, I did look into it for Highways Act orders um, specifically, given we do a lot of work for National Highways. And as long as there is no associated planning application, um, if it's just the order, then no, you wouldn't have to provide BNG. However, um, you, there may be pressure to do so, even if it's not a legal obligation, and there may be a policy um, to, to provide that internal to uh, the highway authority. So um, check that out. But 
D DCOs on the one side and planning applications on the other definitely have to provide it. Anything, any other order that doesn't um, require a specific planning application would not have to provide it. Um, if you place your over 10% improvement on the register now, how would this impact the planning balance in decision making? Um, well, first of all, oh, sorry, not now. It just says how, <laughs> because you can't put it on the register now as the register doesn't exist. Um, well, the, the planning balance would be that you are only providing 10% uh, rather than more than 10%. Presumably, you it is good for the planning balance to provide more than 10% for like your particular development. So if you're creaming off the surplus and using it for something else, then that would slightly reduce the planning balance because you're providing less biodiversity net gain for your particular development. You're providing the minimum. Can the excess BNG only be used by the same development developer in the future if it is put on the register? No, it could be used by anyone. As far as I understand it. I interpreted the excess being over and above what is required in planning, truly additional, rather than being able to register gains above 10%. Uh, well, if there are other considerations that mean you have to, you should, ought to provide more habitat offset, habitat gain, then maybe uh, you want to keep it for your own development. But I, as far as I can see it, um, it does appear that any gains over 10% could be put on the register. But remember that caveat that if the government sees that everyone's doing this, then it might um, put some obligation to provide, not, not to do that eventually, but initially it's going to allow that. Conscious of time, it's one minute to 10, so I'll answer one more question. Do you think the 20th of January 2020 is the 30th of January actually date applies for selling of a development's excess gains? Would a re-baseline and net gain plan need to be retrospective to look at the additionality to planning requirements? Uh, I'm not sure I fully understand that question. So given it's one minute to 10, I'm going to uh, stop there. Um, thank you very much for attending. I see that over 200 people have stayed the course, so I appreciate that. I hope you found that useful. Um, this is only the beginning or the continuation of a dialogue about BNG and um, me keeping up to speed with it and hopefully keeping you up to speed with it. So do keep in touch um, and do get in touch if you have any questions or you want uh, advice on how it's all going to work. Um, Thank you very much for listening and I will leave it there. It is now 10 o'clock and have a good day.